хүний төлөө их хорн чинь юу хийж чадах вэ гэж асуухаасаа өмнө та өөрөө их хорны хүн төлөө юу хийж чадах вэ гэж асуу ян фэжэл хүн төлөгчдэ өнөөдөр манай де факто нийтлүүлгийн зочноор Монгол улсын эдийн засгийн форумд оролцож оролцсон Oliver Wyman гэж компани олон улсын компани а түншлэгч партнёр Антони Стивенс оролцож байна. Антони Стивенс Оливер Вайман Пусин аз номхон далайн салбарын захирал. Кембриджийн эксрголд математикийн чиглэлээр суралцсан төгссөн Оливер Вайман Пусин Омор Америк, Европ аз номхон далайн бүс нутагдах салбар ажилласан туршлагатай. Санхүүгийн бүх төрлийн үйлчлэгээ даатгалын чиглэлээр зөвлөгөө өгдөг. Олон улсын хөгжлийн стратег, өсөлт, корпорацийн хөгжил, эрсдлийн удирдлагын чиглэлээр зөвлөгөө тусалцаа зүйлж ажил үйлдвэрийн байгууллагуудтай хамтран ажилласаар ирсэн. Good evening Anthony. Good evening. Nice to be here. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming to this studio. And as I told you, we start about you who, who you are and how you became one of the world young leader. Thank you. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I've been working for a company called Olive Wyman uh, for just over 16 years now. And uh, in that capacity, I've been uh, a partner for 11 years. Uh, and I've been helping to establish our, our insurance business. Olive Wyman is a consulting company. Uh, and we focus on financial services. So you made it into insurance? Into insurance, exactly. Um, and spent six years building up our insurance business, mm-hmm. uh, initially in Europe. Uh, well, I want to talk about that insurance deeply. Before that, in 2010, yep. World Economic Forum in Davos had selected 197 young men from 97 countries, including you. Mm. And was a surprise and wa- What do you think? Why you are there? It was a surprise. Um, I think if you look at the list of all the, the other uh, young global leaders, it includes a lot of incredibly impressive people. So to be considered in the same group as them uh, was a surprise and uh, a privilege, I think, as well. Um, I think, you know, why was I selected? I, I've been fortunate enough, I think, to, to have been exposed to a lot of opportunities um, to either lead uh, businesses or establish Uh, businesses, and uh, most recently um, running the Asia business of Olive Wyman. So you are uh, in Singapore now. Basically. I'm based in Singapore now, um, and I think you know partly for that, and also for the contributions I've made um, to uh, various industry groups within financial services. How, you, how did you get connected with Mongolia? Uh, well, one of my fellow young global leaders, um, Gan Hutagd, uh, is now the vice minister. Of finance in Mongolia. Um, before that, he was the chief executive of, of, of Tenga Financial Group and of uh, Zagbank. We have uh, three uh, young global leaders from Mongolia right. in the history of the young global leader who is a part of this uh, World Economic Forum, Davos, energizing part of it, <laughs> I understand. Uh, so you, you, ha- you were invited by another young global leader from That's Mongolia, right. Kang Huyak, who is a minister of finance, a, de- a deputy minister of finance. All right, uh, let's talk back about your uh, insurance business. Tell us about uh, uh, you, certainly you have seen Mongolia, it's an emerging new market. What kind of insurance we should be taking first, I mean, organizing in this country? What do you think? It's a good question, and, and you're right, Mongolia is at a critical point in its development, um, and insurance as an industry Uh, is re- relatively underdeveloped in Mongolia at the moment. I, th- I think you have only one life insurance company um, and I think 15 uh, general insurance companies. Insurance, I think, plays an important role in the economy and uh, in terms of providing social uh, goods uh, for people as well. It provides, obviously, personal protection against risk, provides a vehicle to accumulate long-term savings um, and to cover uh, for the case when the breadwinner in the family Uh, no longer is able to earn a living. Um, so I think insurance plays a very important role, um, and I think it is important for Mongolia's development as an economy uh, and as a society uh, to have a strong insurance industry. Um, 
that probably means developing uh, a stronger life insurance sector, particularly for long-term savings, uh, and to remove the burden from the state of having to cover all of the, um, uh, the potential accidents that can happen to people during their lifetime. Um, I think also, um, as Mongolia develops its corporate sector, um, uh, it's important that uh, companies that do business in Mongolia don't have to rely on foreign insurance companies to get the protection they need for their plants and their facilities in Mongolia, and that that value remains in the country rather than leaking out of the country. So the development of national insurance system inside of the country is a key factor for saving? I think so. And also saving is a key factor of insurance as well? Correct. I think there's a chicken and an egg. Yep. Uh, in that connection, how do you find... Uh, Mongolian banking development today? Well, ob obviously, Mongolia uh, has been recovering from a financial crisis uh, uh, one to two years ago. Um, and therefore, the, the banking system is, uh, is now much stronger than it was uh, two years ago. Um, one of the challenges is that Mongolia has huge investment needs in infrastructure, in project finance, uh, and in developing uh, its corporate sector outside of mining as well. Um, Having a banking sector that is able to efficiently finance all of that infrastructure investment, uh, I think is incredibly important. Um, part of that clearly will come from the commercial banks. Part of that also has to come from um, uh, alternative financing mechanisms. Uh, that's why I think it is exciting uh, that the Mongolian parliament has passed primary legislation uh, to establish a development bank uh, and also to support public-private well, partnerships. Do you think the, about the efficiency of development bank uh, based on key, uh, real cases? Take a case of Singapore, I believe, a successful one. And uh, what national development bank is to pay particular attention to to be a success story? I think there are many cases, some more successful, some perhaps less successful, um, within uh, the development banking uh, sector. Um, rather than pointing to any individual success stories, because I think all of them perhaps have a mixture of things which went well and things which perhaps might have been done differently, I think it's maybe better to draw some of the lessons from the development banking experience. Um, one is I think it's important to have very strong risk management. That's true of all banks. It's particularly true of development banks because the nature of the lending that they do is typically much larger um, uh, loans. Um, often the projects that they finance, uh, the risks may be quite difficult to assess. Infrastructure. Infrastructure, project finance, and airports, so on. Etc. Uh, they're often they're one-off. What is deals. the best way of the risk management of such sort of operations for the bank? It's a mixture, I think, of, of governance. Yeah, um, certainly on the operation side, yes. On the operational side, I, I think it's around having... Ultimately, it's around having capable people in an independent risk management function that are empowered to challenge, question, analyze individual How you will get independent uh, risk uh, uh, auditor for the bank like this, from whom it will consist of? I think there's a variety of, of sources. Um, if you look at uh, the background of most risk managers in, in banks elsewhere in the world, um, there's no obvious single source. Some of them come from the business side, uh, so you do find a lot of ex-transaction people mm. uh, involved in risk management. Often they can provide a very good internal perspective uh, on, uh, on risks. You do find a lot of uh, mathematicians, you find a lot of uh, people with an economics background, statistics background, because risk management does have a lot of technical uh, disciplines involved in it. You find some people who come from the regulatory side. You find some people with a legal background. So I think it's, a, it's a important to bear in mind that risk management is not a single discipline. It's a multidisciplinary function. And you need to have people who can cover all different kinds of risks, whether they're operational risks, whether they're financial risks, whether they're credit risks, whether they're reputational risks. The risk of a development bank is quite close or directly connected with the risk of the country, correct? in particular. And uh, in this country, the economy a lot depends on mining and this uh, commodity circles, prices. In that sense, uh, risk of the country 
uh, from on the market so much. What you would advise on that? How we can take care of better? And what kind of structure we need, or things we have to pay attention as a country? It's a good question. And uh, at the Mongolian Economic Forum today, um, there was a, a fairly healthy debate, I think, about whether the natural wealth of Mongolia is a blessing or a curse. Uh, and I think it certainly has elements of both. Um, on the one hand, it does provide a huge amount of wealth that can support investments in developing the economy more broadly. On the other hand, it does create a concentration of exposure to commodity prices in particular and to political uh, trade tensions. Um, I think there are both long-term and short-term things that you can do to manage those risks. In the long term, the only way to ultimately manage those risks is to diversify the economy, to build other sectors that can spread the risk um, in the economy away from just a single uh, That's set of That's what we try prices. to figure out, how to diversify. And I don't, uh, we, I mean, we have traditional agricultural animal husbandry, best economics uh, companies, but we don't go much quite well on that for diversifying, though they are, half of the population is busy with that sector. And we, yet we talk about a lot about the financial sector, development, etc. How is uh, realistic is this? I think financial infrastructure is important as an enabler for other sectors of the economy. I think it's, um, as the global financial crisis has shown, it can be dangerous to depend too heavily on the financial sector for economic growth. I think the experience of the UK in particular um, I'm British, uh, so it's particularly close to home, has shown that if you depend too heavily on the financial sector, uh, it's no different to depending too heavily on the mineral sector. It has its own booms and busts. Um, so I think for an economy like Mongolia that is developing, it's important to view the financial sector as an enabling mechanism to develop a broader, more diverse economy, and also as a mechanism for mitigating shocks to the system yes. and dispersing those shocks across the border economy so that you don't uh, uh, have, uh, over time, um, so they don't disrupt economic activity too See, greatly. Uh, we have a quite large government, which is uh, almost two-thirds of economy now with their spending power. And uh, then yet we have to risk this inside operation risk, and the, we have this commodity circle outside risk. And altogether, what would be... Uh, relations of this large government and this uh, financial sector development? Over time, clearly, um, the bulk of economic growth has to come from the private sector. Um, the role of the financial sector, I think, uh, is in enabling resources and capital to reach the parts of the private sector where there are attractive growth opportunities, to provide investment to support that growth, uh, and to channel savings, which will increase over time as the country becomes wealthier, so in productively into those growth opportunities. So basically, in the economy, the more value creation is made in private sector. That's true for most economies. Yep. Then, uh, uh, so we, we have, for example, our major airlines, Mongol National Airlines, still owned by the government, and we have a long debate, and every government talks about privatization for now years, 20 years, um, if you know how it was, it was done with the British Airways. I understand it was a completely uh, government one. Correct. Then they have been privatizing, if you recall anything about the British Airways. Uh, it was uh, a long time ago that British Airways was privatized, and uh, there were several other, uh, I think across the whole of Europe, most of the airlines were, were privatized. Um, I think the experience has been mixed. Um, Airline, the airline industry uh, is a challenging industry economically. It's very capital intensive, very cyclical, um, actually has relatively low barriers to entry, um, and of course also has a lot of political interference uh, in terms of various uh, constraints on expansion. Um, and as a result, um, most airlines globally lose money, uh, don't cover their cost of capital. Japanese um, airlines... Japan, uh, JAL, I think it's a good example. Uh, obviously, in the US, you Singapore? Had, Singapore Airlines is an exception to that rule. It's one of the most profitable airlines in the it's world. Owned by state? Uh, it is privately owned. It's a listed company. That's uh, why? 
Well, it is partially owned by Tomasic, which is a uh, government-owned uh, investment well, fund. Well, that's a good question. How big Tomasic has share in uh, Singapore Airlines? I forget the exact percentage. Uh -huh. So uh, this is a, could it be a good example where Development Bank, which is Tomasic in, in uh, Singapore, uh, was a good player in the right place uh, at the right time? I think one of the interesting things about Tomasic is that mm. Uh, it runs itself very much like a commercial enterprise. It's mm -hmm. very much arm's length. It has very clear governance standards. Mm -hmm. um, they have strong performance standards. So there is no real political interference in that's any the, of the companies which they have. That's the big about Timasek, Timasek holding. How big is Timasek holding compared to a Singapore economy? Uh, well, it's, it's uh, north of $100 uh, billion dollars in assets under management. Uh, Singapore uh, is, is four, 4 million people, 4.5 million people. A big economy. Uh, and about $40,000 per head, so it's about $150, $160 billion uh, in uh, GDP. So it is almost uh, half of the economy asset size uh, company today. It's probably about the same size, uh, but of course it's not a direct comparison because assets is a stock and the economy is a flow. Yeah, GDP is and a flow. It, it also works uh, abroad. Not only in Singapore. Domestic has significant overseas holdings. How big assets abroad? I don't know the exact percentage, but they have extensive investments in, in North America and Europe, and increasingly, of course, in, uh, in other emerging, in emerging markets in Asia. And it is also very uh, well known with its professional staff management, the governance. And it sources a lot of its uh, staff from, uh, from the private sector and from the professional asset management and alternative investments. Well, I hope our develop, new development bank will be quite like that. I wish. Uh, let's talk about um, capital market development in the country, which is quite in, uh, in a very infant level. As we have talked today, this morning, there is even a debate, a very, very young industry. What is your take on that? How Mongolia will go? What, how do you... How do you Visualize it. It's a tough question to answer right now because the capital markets in Mongolia are still very much in their infancy. I, I think I were, the numbers I was hearing today uh, was that a total market capitalization of the actively traded stocks in the Mongolian stock exchanges is $3 billion. And if you look at the Mongolian companies that are listed overseas, their total market capitalization is more like $20 billion. So um, clearly at the moment, the Mongolian stock exchange um, is not the first destination for capital raising for many Mongolian Is it companies. because also uh, the country is very less known or is not because, you know, why do you think is it doesn't work? Part of it could well. be just because of, of infrastructure um, and uh, the regulatory framework is still, again, very much in its infancy. Uh -huh. If you look at other exchanges around the world, um, they have been in existence for, for many, many years. They have a well-established regulatory framework. They have listing requirements that have been tried and tested and refined for many years. Um, so in a sense, it's not surprising. Um, the mineral wealth that uh, the Mongolia now has is relatively new, um, and it's only been 20 years since, since the fall of the socialist uh, communist regime. So in many ways, it's not surprising that um, a lot of this infrastructure is still in its infancy. Um, it is important to develop it, I think, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is it is important to have a low cost of capital, to have an efficient means of raising capital for Mongolian enterprises. Having an efficient, uh, technologically advanced, uh, and easy to do business in exchange. Now we're uh, going to important. work with the London Exchange. That's what I hear. Hopefully, and I think this it's, infrastructure uh, is coming with them. Uh, a question. Our government is saying that uh, some strategic uh, deposits based shares will be sold in Mongolian stock exchange and also in the international one. What will be the connection between these two? Because it's the same company, a part of shares are sold here, another sold is there. If there is any such experiences around the world, that you are listed on two markets, one is domestic, one is international, and then how it is related to each other? There's many examples of, of dual listings. Um, 
And I think uh, the reason people do it is because they want to tap into liquidity to investors uh, in different markets. You know, there are many uh, investors in, in the UK and Australia or who trade in the UK and Australia who have a strong interest in ma- mining and natural resource companies. If you look at companies like Rio Tinto, uh, that's listed in, mm-hmm. in the UK, if you look at BHP Billiton, um, those are peer companies, companies that would be comparable to uh, many of the companies uh, from Mongolia that are going to be seeking listings. Um, so I think it's important when you're thinking about um, a capital-raising strategy mm-hmm. that you try to position yourself in a way which makes you attractive to the broadest set of potential investors as possible. So it is a part of the same company here, sold here and sold here. Could they, the investor here can go and buy that or that those shares or it is to be designated for the particular market? It varies. Obviously, in China, you do have separate designations where there are restrictions on who is able to buy which designation. Uh-huh. Um, the cost of the B shares, etc.? Exactly, yeah, the, a, the A shares, the H shares. Uh, is, it, uh, is there particular shares in China that on the Chinese citizens buy? Correct, yeah. Well, there are restrictions on who can uh, buy equities within China and who can trade securities in China. So of the same company, uh, shares could be A and B? Correct. By ratios or by certain percentage, ten percent. No, they the have their separate listings, and sometimes they're separate subsidiaries within the same holding company. Oh, so oh, you I could see. have a, a separate listing of a subsidiary or holding company. A separate currency, maybe. And often they'll be denominated in separate currency. Although well, in Hong Kong, they've recently uh, enabled uh, uh, RMB denominated equity issuance. Oh, uh, is in it? Hong Kong. How big the RMB denominated shares uh, and total? Market uh, well, currently it's, it's negligible time. because it's only just been announced. Just been announced. But I think you will see that growing over time. You have um, currently uh, RMB settlements of trade uh-huh. um, now recently rolled out uh, to more than 60,000 enterprises in China um, and something in the, in the region of 2 or 3% of total uh, imports are now settled in RMB. And that's, of course, leading to uh, a big increase in the RMB deposit base in Hong Kong which, of course, will create demand then for R&B investment vehicles. Maybe you have heard also that uh, there is certain talk, at least in Mongolia. Government sometimes talks about sovereign bonds of Mongolia. How, uh, how realistic is this? What is to be the base underlying asset of these bonds? And how big and how long it takes time? What do you think? There's two fundamental underlying basis for for any debt issuance of of a sovereign. Uh, One is its tax-raising powers, uh, and the second are physical assets which it owns and which generate revenue themselves, commercial revenue, that can be used to create um, uh, asset-backed bonds or securities. Mm -hmm. Um, In the case of Mongolia, I can think of of both both options being potentially interesting. Do they specify Uh, the underlying asset of any sovereign bond? Uh, I issue the bonds. Typically, um, uh, those are done, I mean, in the U.S., uh, that's more done at the municipal level, where you have particular utilities or particular uh, infrastructure assets, which can then be uh, essentially uh, used as security. Well, that's uh, what we want to have in Ulaanbaatar city, right. where they have mini bonds. And we, mini bonds is exempted from tax rate in several cases. Correct, in the U.S. In, yeah. in U.S. Okay. That's why the people buy, because if you buy... Uh, on the uh, coupon, you are tax exempted, right? Correct. And uh, how long usually the terms would be on sovereign bonds? Americans are 25, 30 years. Sure, and you have some perpetual uh, sovereign yes. bonds that have been issued as well. Is course. it? Uh, <laughs> well. It's very hard to do that unless you are a highly rated sovereign. Yes. So if you're looking at, at sovereigns that are likely to be um, in the same development category as yes. Mongolia, they tend to be a lot shorter dated. Uh, Not surprisingly, because um, uh, investors typically um, will not be so secure in the long-term fiscal position of of countries that don't have a particular for a country like Mongolia, where fiscal expenses are so high. Clearly, uh, fiscal position is something which investors look at when they're evaluating. Will sovereign bonds, in a way, discipline uh, that government or not? Yes, I I think they do. In terms of, Uh, will there be any restrictions in terms of? lavish spending. It's very rare for sovereign bonds to have covenants associated with them. Uh-huh. Um, uh, typically, um, the, the discipline is uh, that if you have deficits, you need to ultimately uh, continue to attract 
international investors to buy your sovereign bonds. On one side, yes. So the discipline is that if, if, you, if you default on your bonds or if you restructure, uh, there's a period of time over which it's very difficult then to raise financing. Yep. Um, and I think many of the emerging market economies in Latin America, for example, uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s that, uh, that either went through restructurings or default experiences, um, Argentina, they were shut out of, example. Yeah, they were shut out of the capital markets for a period of time. Yeah, a couple of times Argentina did, and recently Greece had uh, to ask more money from abroad, right? Uh, yeah, Greece has not more deficit. had a restructuring or defaulting, but uh, they've been essentially supported uh, by emergency facilities uh, yeah, from the my, uh, European my, Central Bank. My warning is, you know, at the level of uh, 13% of deficit, 13% uh, of GDP deficit, Greece was able almost collapsed, and our deficit at this time it was ten percent. And uh, now they still promise to be at around well, best time, uh, worst time was uh, about ten. Then once it was even five, now it's going to be even more. And in that situation, with sovereign bonds together, it's not so much matching situation. It depends a little bit on economic growth, of course, as well. Uh, if you have a growing economy, mm -hmm. then, of course, that creates a future tax base that can be used to support uh, sovereign bonds and, and debt, even if you have a primary deficit. Um, so I, I don't think it's a simple question of what the size of the deficit is. It's a combination of the size of deficit, future growth prospects, and, of course, the current level of the, tax bur of the debt burden as well. Yep. You are a mathematician. I am a mathematician. You have an honor from Cambridge. Correct, yes. I mean, how you became uh, then a uh, financier from uh, mathematicians? How, what happened? Uh, well, mathematics is, uh, I guess, at the heart of a lot of financial technology. Um, and I've always been fascinated by economics. Uh, I've always viewed economics as being um, an interesting way of applying some of the tools that you learn about in mathematics to the real world. And it has real impact as well. It's, it's something which shapes the life of everyone uh, in society. So I think it was through my interest in economics and applying some of the technical skills that you learn in mathematics to real-world problems uh, that caused me to be interested in finance. And finance is very much at the heart of how economies work. Uh, it's, the, it's the fuel um, uh, that, that drives economies. So in Cambridge, when you studied, you have been studying about mathematics Mathematics, mathematic model of uh, financing, development, financial modeling, what the particular sector you have in? Um, a lot of pure mathematics, actually. Uh, so um, uh, most of the mathematics I studied was not specifically uh -huh. designed for, for finance or for economics, but uh, mathematics is a toolkit, and many of the tools that you use, you can, you can use them to, uh, uh, to support engineering, um, fluid mechanics, economics, finance, uh, they have a wide range of applications. I did a lot of work in probability and statistics, and that clearly has a lot of relevance. Uh, in all life of society and in every profession, you, you can use that mathematical, mathematics as a tool to model for C as much as possible based on your information you have, right? Uh, I think it, predictions are always very difficult, and I think people can overuse mathematics and a math mathematical model is only as good as the assumptions that go into defining the model. Um, and as we've seen in the financial crisis, excessive use of models and reliance on models without a bit of common sense and judgment can be very, very dangerous indeed. Um, so I think mathematics is a very useful tool, but like any tool, uh, a sharp knife or a screwdriver, if you don't use it in the right way with a lot of common sense, you can damage yourself. Uh, what was if, if you had uh, any such a moment where you were feeling like you were very close to reality made your mathematical expectations or moduli? I think a lot of the the early work that I did when I first went into consulting in financial services, uh, which was around building credit rating models, uh, in many cases for. Um, for unusual types of lending. So when I started out in, in management consulting, uh, my first project was working for a Scandinavian bank, um, helping them to build models to understand shipping finance. So shipping finance sounds like a very obscure and very complicated, very not related at all to mathematics. But we analyzed hundreds and hundreds of different shipping loans, and then we did the same for oil and gas loans, for real estate Wonderful. loans. 
We looked at all the different factors that could affect the financial strength, the revenues, the expenses of the, um, of the borrowers. And then we produced models that would predict, um, not with certainty, but would predict the likelihood that different borrowers would get into difficulty. And that proved extremely powerful. Um, so I think that was probably the area where I came closest to real life because you know, you're talking about real assets, ships, oil and gas uh, projects and so on. You know, I'm asking this question because mathematics is a very popular discipline in this country. And now our students go abroad and get some prizes and very popular. And yet, I'm not sure everybody understands that mathematics is not only science, mm -hmm. but it's a great tool of finance, of any engineering, where you can, with this mathematics, can make a, a lot of money too. I think that's very true. I think a lot of mathematicians go on to have very successful and very uh, highly compensated careers in financial services. Um, but I think also it's, it's, it's a, a very worthwhile discipline for other reasons as well. I, I think it's, uh, it teaches logical thinking. Yes. Um, That's the it, power of everything. Which is the power of any academic discipline. I, I think it's fantastic and it's a great asset and resource for Mongolia that you have so many talented young mathematicians because um, I think that will be a great resource, a great human resource for the society in, in the future. Um, but I think it has, aside from the financial and the economic benefits, um, because I think it encourages logical thinking, um, I think it's also good for, good for the soul. It sounds like an odd thing to say, but um, the ability to think dispassionately about a problem, break it down into its component pieces. I think mathematics has a lot in common with law in that sense. It's a very logical, structured way of looking at problems. And as a result, I think it, it does make you um, potentially a, a, a more useful member of society in ways which go beyond your, your own job. You know, young global leaders are people select especially for their contribution to making this world, the state of the world we live in, better. And you are one of them, and I'm very happy to have you with my program and uh, come back to Mongolia, meet us again, and then we will have another very interesting uh, cycle of conversation. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed being here for these last two days, and I very much hope to come to Mongolia again soon. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Young, fragile.